Okay, we're live now. Hi guys. Hello everyone. Hi Colin. Um, would you like to turn on the mic? If you can try. Anyway, hello everyone. Thank you for attending this session and thank you Frank for the opportunity to be part of the Horaces event the second time. Unfortunately, today we can't have Martha with us um, and I'm here standing in to moderate the panel. I'm Cherie from Singapore. After a decade in personal finance space, I founded uh, Planner B, a digital finance financial planning app made for Gen Z in Asia. We are empowering people with a platform to manage their money better, no matter how little or much they have. I'm happy to be here today to discuss the topic of fintech post-COVID. So to summarize the topic a little bit first, today we will discuss some key areas in the fintech scene post-COVID. And that would include things like acceleration of in innovations, products as a result of COVID that would have otherwise taken years. Consumers of fintech, how they are differentiated between customer segments, changing consumer behaviors as a result, how the roles of governments as an, an enabler or an inhibitor to this segment, not forgetting financial inclusion and equality. We'll touch a little bit of a heavy topics in there. Um, and the insurance and legacy systems and challenges that these old companies face uh, as a result of this situation. Uh, yeah, and the last two would be how we can scale fintech and emerging markets in places such as Africa and India. Okay, let's start off the with the panelists introducing themselves. Um, Suzanne, would you like to start? Thank you, Jerry, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, interesting uh, panel. I have worked with uh, fintechs uh, for the last uh, 10 years, and I have uh, 10 years as an entrepreneur in Nordea Bank, uh, one of the largest uh, banks in, in the Northern uh, Europe. Uh, I'm now currently a CEO of uh, Fintech uh, Mundi, and we are helping fintechs uh, to scale and commercialize uh, all over the world. Um, Swipe, uh, I was the executive chairman and I helped them from uh, Proof of concept to IPO uh, on the, the stock exchange in, in Stockholm, and then another company from uh, Air, from uh, Slides to uh, mergers and acquisition, and uh, Crunchfish, uh, who's uh, uh, in Sweden, and then they're working their way into India. I've been uh, chairman for quite a lot of uh, companies and, uh, and uh, board director for uh, the global financial service uh, market. Write uh, a few reports uh, on when it comes to fintech and, and, and a speaker, and we also arrange uh, a few events uh, like uh, financial inclusion summit. And I'm also a, a private investor for a few selected fintech companies. Thank you. Nice, Vikas. How about you? Uh, I'm Vikas uh, Sharon. I'm in California, uh, and uh, I have had a couple of innings uh, with fintech uh, in the past and uh, current innings from a different perspective. I uh, dabbled with FinTech when I got involved with building Wingspan Bank, which was the first internet bank in the world. And uh, it taught me a lot of interesting lessons. And during the course, I'll probably share a few of them. Uh, then uh, uh, several uh, years ago, I started Regalix, essentially a marketing company that taught me, and I worked with a lot of FinTech companies uh, through the years, uh, including large legacy ones like uh, Citibank, so the world to uh, back then where innovative startups no longer uh, like uh, PayPal and, uh, uh, and businesses like that. Uh, and more recently, uh, companies uh, like uh, Google uh, Pay, Amazon Pay, and, and lots of very interesting uh, uh, pieces of the fintech puzzle that we are helping take to market and promote, giving me a very different perspective, uh, which is more outside in on why consumers adopt uh, fintech. Looking forward to an interesting uh, conversation. Cool. So with the last note that you, you mentioned, um, what do you think consumers are interested in, in, in fintech? What exactly would that be? 
Okay, let me try to get Colin the mic. Mm. Oh. What was that question again, Jerry? Hi, Colin. Hi, how are you? Sorry about that. <laughs> A little bit slow yeah, getting yeah. in here. So. This works too. Oh. Great to join you. Nice, Colin. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Colin Walsh, the founder and CEO of Borrow Bank. Uh, recently became a full national bank here in the United States. Uh, we started as a fintech uh, a, about five years ago and received all the approvals from the uh, Office of the Controller of the Currency, the FDIC, and the Federal Reserve here in the United States. So we're the first fintech to be operating as a national bank. It's a pleasure to join you today to talk a little bit about our journey and, and more globally thinking about how fintech is really starting to change finance around the world uh, and really opening up financial opportunity to millions of consumers. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Sherry. Nice. Um, yeah, so I was just asking Vikas about um, his experience and, and understanding about what consumers are looking for in fintech. Sure. And I'll uh, split that into two uh, very brief uh, sections. One was when uh, I was building a fintech uh, in Wingspan Bank. And there we had built uh, a marketplace. Uh, this was the early days of deregulation. And we had built uh, lots of very interesting uh, place where we had built, uh, amongst many things, uh, insurance mar marketplace, uh, uh, mutual fund or investment marketplace, uh, mortgage marketplace, lending marketplace, things like that. Um, my first uh, learning was uh, uh, a much deeper understanding of what uh, fintech was really all about. And if I was to distill it down into something very, very simple, it would uh, translate into the ability to create interesting uh, contracts between uh, two or multiple parties and everything else is about administrating those the, those set of contracts uh, whether a, a person is providing a service of value or a product of value and somebody is receiving something of value on the other end so essentially it is just a series of back to back contracts and uh, the entire technology that uh, went into building the bank was really about managing and maintaining those numerous uh, contracts in a standardized uh, model and administrating those contracts. So, uh, the entire fintech for me really translated into how interesting can those contracts get and how easy can you make uh, administration of those uh, financial contracts. So that was the first innings. The second innings was really uh, when I was looking at it from an outside-in perspective, helping uh, fintech companies uh, scale their uh, business footprint in different parts of the world, understanding why consumers uh, uh, entered into these contracts was really the critical, uh, uh, critical factor. Uh, a lot of uh, businesses uh, over the years uh, were focused on moving money in different parts of the world as an example. We work with uh, Zoom, which got acquired by PayPal, PayPal themselves, and a bunch of uh, companies that really were in the business of moving money from uh, one part of the world to the other and understanding why people move money and what motivations lie behind those uh, financial contracts was really eye-opening and uh, led into a lot of uh, innovations within PayPal and other companies that we work with when uh, when we could share those mega trends so for example somebody who's uh, moving money from uh, uh, from uh, their current location in uh, in uh, vancouver in canada to uh, uh, to india or uh, from uh, uh, uae to another part of the world what was really the motivation why were they doing it and if you could understand that better you could uh, create better transactions and experience to enable that. And there was a lot of learning uh, related to that. And I can happy to share a lot more stories as we get along, but I don't want to take all of my time uh, with those. But uh, but uh, a much deeper understanding. So Sherry, you're doing a startup with uh, Zen Y and Zen Z. The motivations of why Zen Y or Zen Z would uh, 
adopt insurance or micro insurance as you uh, call it would uh, would really be the foundation of uh, of scaling the venture yeah exactly um, sure. If I could just jump in for a second just to add on to what's been said, but I think that you know there was a lot of infrastructure early days, you know, and, and there still is in terms of helping banks and other financial institutions use digital technologies to, to compete, and whether it's on the fraud and identity side or it's you know risk management, mm -hmm. automation of origination processes. Um, I think from a consumer perspective, there really has been this evolution from a series of point solutions around payments and lending and wealth management into more holistic and I think we're seeing now and particularly post COVID more of a re-aggregation and a rebundling of a lot of these point solutions into uh, more holistic ways of, of being able to solve real customer pain points and I think that's something that's an exciting trend that's starting to take hold across the world. Some of the challenges uh, we see uh, for the fintechs uh, going forward uh, or what they are saying themselves is that um, funding uh, to scale their uh, companies uh, is, is a key uh, element uh, because there's money out there but then to, to be uh, so specific uh, in uh, getting those uh, money uh, is another thing and then regulatory uh, issues uh, is uh, is on the rise uh, we see here in the Europe uh, open banking has uh, been out for to uh, incentivize entrepreneurship uh, whether it's a financial service or it's a fintech uh, it doesn't matter you, you have to comply with the regulation uh, anyway and that that has uh, been taking a while because you need to have the banks uh, with you uh, to do them and they have been uh, dragging their feet uh, going forward but hopefully now they're they're opening up with them and then uh, once you have started to scale a little bit then it's, it's to build a sustainable income that that uh, in, income stream that is, is a key element uh, you can build and build and build and scale and scale, but uh, in the end, uh, you need uh, sustainable income uh, coming forward. Cool. Um, moving, moving to perhaps understanding if we've seen any of um, products, services, um, inventions that were accelerated as a result of COVID-19 within the fintech scene. Is there anything that you've seen that's interesting? Yeah, on, on the merchant uh, side, those who were uh, in store uh, and didn't have the e-commerce uh, to it, they have really uh, speeded up their process to, to become uh, much more uh, digital uh, to it. So uh, if you can have both uh, the in-store uh, selling and uh, the e-commerce, uh, that has been uh, working very, very uh, nice. And then we also see uh, some of the bigger corporations um, that uh, prior to COVID, they didn't have time or they didn't focus or, or whatever the excuse was. Now they're coming back and say, we need to speed up our digitalization. So that's those two, the merchants and the digitalization uh, has uh, worked nicely during the, the COVID. And I totally agree with no, no, I was just echoing what Susan was saying. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, Google Pay and Amazon Pay. and. Mm -hmm. uh, Merchants and uh, the digital wallets on the consumer side have really, really skyrocketed in ad adoption. And uh, merchants that are adopting uh, digital payments are really, uh, really being successful. And there are numerous stories that uh, we can recount uh, where we see this over and over again. I would echo that. I think that, you know, huge adoption of digital, both from a payments perspective and a banking perspective. And I think some of the things from a consumer standpoint that there's been more focus on uh, in the wake of some of the economic fallout from COVID and some structural unemployment is finding solutions to help people bridge their cash flow because many people are stretched. Um, you know, the governments have, have done somewhat, you know, in terms of helping with economic stimulus, but, you know, helping people, you know, with small dollar lending solutions, helping people on um, access funds earlier as they're still getting paid. Maybe they have reduced hours, um, helping people find access to in supplemental income. And these are all things that I think fintechs are trying to innovate to be able to help people get through this uh, very difficult period. Yeah, nice. And and where in um, in Asia, at least I've been seeing in Singapore, um, it's surprising to know that a lot of things are still done on hard copy paper, especially in the insurance uh, segment. And within three weeks, they have moved everything online, 
although it's pretty much a PDF form for some companies that are large with a lot of legacy systems, um, mm. it's a huge move that we've taken, I would say, five years for them to move forward. Yeah. Mm. In, in comparison to a tech-first company that are mm -hmm. tech and fintech or insure tech, these insurance financial institutions that are adding tech to, to, to their solutions are taking a lot longer than they should. Yeah. Um, Just to, to build on uh, what uh, Colin was saying about uh, the payment uh, side, if you look at uh, India, uh, another uh, government that is incentivizing uh, digital uh, payment, of course, uh, COVID uh, uh, going from um, uh, uh, the bills or the, the notes uh, to pay with or, uh, and then to, to cashless, uh, this has uh, spiraled uh, very nicely. Of course, it takes time because you have to comply and security and all these uh, things uh, but a lot is uh, happening uh, of course in the cities but also in the rural area of uh, of uh, india which is yeah. uh, very interesting in india if you look at uh, all the big uh, data players are really getting into fintech in a big way uh, facebook being the latest that has filed for uh, 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 financial uh, as a fintech with their WhatsApp uh, penetration that is very deep in the India market. Uh, we are beginning to see uh, data being translated into currency in, mm. in some ways and that's the underpinning of seeing a very new breed of uh, fintech players emerge and uh, get to prominence in a very short uh, order in uh, especially large markets like India believe China and uh, the rest of the world. And I think one of the things, and Susan, uh, Suzanne touched on this earlier, was uh, just how to monetize in these different fintech models. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that in certain markets like India and, and Europe and other places where you know pay, traditional payments revenue has uh, made it more challenging for innovators to find an economic model, a sustainable economic model. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think they're turning towards solutions that are more data driven, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how to drive more subscription type revenues or potentially ad revenues, which I worry about if that becomes their mm -hmm. model for a lot of reasons, mm -hmm. but um, or lending. And so I think each market kind of has a slightly different point of entry in but but I think going back to the, the first principle of, you know, whatever these innovators are doing, they ultimately have to find a sustainable business model because pursuing growth at all costs uh, when you don't have a, a sustainable long term model just isn't viable in the long run. And so uh, but I think each each market has a different sort of structure that, that presents opportunities and, and, and challenges uh, for innovators. Nice. And uh, we're beginning to see, uh, to that point, Colin, uh, mm -hmm. players like Amazon and others, while we worry about data being the currency mm -hmm. uh, uh, instead of gold as the underpinnings of uh, uh, of underwriting. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't bode well for consumers in the long run, potentially. <laughs> that's, you know, the consumer protection angle is, is important. Which is, which is true. But what we are beginning to see, the wallet companies are beginning to mature and get into micro lending and uh, mm. larger lending mm -hmm. areas and also insurance where uh, uh, Amazon uh, announced uh, making their uh, toes wet with insurance in India uh, along with uh, becoming a lender and WhatsApp uh, at Facebook is also tiptoeing and filed uh, for uh, approved government approvals are in the waiting period to get into uh, because transactions alone and digital wallet and, uh, and the economies of scale don't add up. Even when uh, you get into uh, penetration with uh, 60 million uh, subscribers and things like that, as an organization, you're still not able to make uh, money. You're still spending money to uh, acquire and stay afloat. You've seen that with uh, players like uh, Paytm and others in India that have uh, significant penetration being legacy players in the market, but uh, are still uh, 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 needing a lot of venture money yeah, to sure. continue to scale and grow. Sure. Yeah, and then on that note, uh, there are more segments than uh, consumers, uh, also the private side. Uh, if you move over to the to the commercial side and uh, SMEs, uh, small uh, business uh, entities, uh, there's a lot to be, do, be done there, uh, digitalization, payment, lending, and, and so forth. And, and particularly 
support small uh, business units. Uh, uh, we're working with one uh, Danish uh, company, Jamie One, and they are in uh, Ethiopia and uh, Kenya and uh, quite a few of the African market where they have savings uh, groups for women and they have digitalized it. And then since they don't have a bank account, uh, you don't have a credit score or a credit uh, history. And if you don't have a credit history, it's uh, hard to do the, the digital, uh, the digital uh, way of, of saving. But with these uh, uh, ladies or female entrepreneurs, uh, they go, they qualify each one because they're saying this is a, a good financial opportunity. And, and in that way, they can also build up uh, their credit scoring and then and move on uh, into their business and earn more money. So that's a good way to be utilizing. Uh, absolutely, Susan. And uh, the entire uh, microfinance uh, industry and uh, uh, was based on uh, lending on a different mm. set of parameters, on mm. a socioeconomic uh, parameter with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with a different orientation. Mm. Uh, the part of uh, uh, what I was alluding to from the data standpoint is the risk profiling models that data rich companies are coming in. Mm. Uh, for example, in the in the US, we've traditionally had uh, three rich credit bureaus that pretty much uh, provided indices that was valuable for underwriting credit risk uh, profile. Uh, but there's a whole breed of players that are coming and saying that maybe that model does not apply if we start looking at uh, segments that uh, don't have rich credit histories and profiles to underwrite this, but could, all, could still be very uh, profitable uh, segments to go after. In India, there is no, for example, uh, equivalent of uh, credit risk profile uh, that exists. Uh, it's always been very social in orientation. You go to mm. a bank, the bank manager knows you, you get the loan, and if you mm. are a known entity, you don't uh, give the loan. Uh, based on who can vouch for whom, that's that's how it happens. And and, uh, and companies like Facebook and uh, Amazon of the world are sitting on a different set of data elements and are beginning to build uh, risk profiles very differently than uh, traditional models that were there in the industry and, and are able to underwrite uh, financial products and insurance products differently. In, and I, think, in their, I think if done well, this could help um, a very big source of what I, I, certainly in the United States, but I think other parts of the world as well, is a real form of structural uh, financial inequality and that people who, you know, when the system has depended on backward looking uh, underwriting tools and methods like you know scoring that uh, people who don't have credit or they're new to credit or they may have damaged their credit have a very hard time accessing affordable credit and I think that if data can be used in innovative ways whether it's by big tech or by fintech or by other players then this is where the transaction data could actually be very valuable in terms of trying to find ways to help people build credit or repair credit um, and, and as we all know, I mean, credit plays in a very important part in terms of people's ability to sort of climb the wealth ladder and, and, mm. and realize greater financial opportunity. Uh, I, I also think this is an interesting conversation on the regulatory front as well, because uh, regulators also are trying to figure out how to, um, you know, experiment with this in a way that doesn't sort of open the door for bad actors who are going to exploit this. Um, and. And, and but also be able to try to drive greater financial inclusion. So I think this is going to be a very interesting debate going forward uh, that will happen across the whole spectrum of fintech players. Mm. So, Colin, then, uh, if we, uh, I'm sorry. Go so, ahead. Uh, uh, just uh, getting a s small point in. Uh, traditional institutions, if you look at uh, in the U.S., it's the Federal Reserve, and in India it's the RBI. And every country has its own uh, similar body. Uh, with a different uh, governance structure. When they were created, Federal Reserve had uh, gold as the currency that uh, was stored in the vault and uh, that was uh, used for, uh, but the world has changed and even Federal Reserve has moved on from uh, gold in their vault as their uh, primary uh, deposit currency to uh, issue uh, notes against. Uh, it's really translated into data as a currency and trust, and trust, because I think it's all data and trust. Yes. Trust. Uh, yeah. 
and and that uh, is an underpinning for uh, a very different type of a financial governance organization that needs to come into existence which is not uh, possibly the RBI of or the federal reserve which uh, has been built over uh, so many years with a certain legacy and a mindset uh, to think of the underlying uh, currency uh, being not gold but uh, data and trust is calling a, a good example in that financial in china i mean ant grew into this massive organization mm-hmm. using its data in ways to be able to provide access to a, a, a wide range of services but predominantly it started with credit um mm-hmm. and you know it and now i think the chinese government is starting to monitor it a little more closely but but i think that it sort of grew you know very large and provided access to to products at, at, at very you know, very what from what least what i've been able to see very low loss rates uh because it was using its data in in, in a very effective manner so i think we'll see more examples of that <laughs> Absolutely. And then uh, going back to the regulation uh, part of it, uh, who should uh, who should set uh, the regulations? I mentioned uh, Europe uh, that uh, they uh, have 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 harmonized the uh, financial uh, regulation across the uh, the region. Uh, Africa um, have uh, has some challenges uh, because uh, each uh, country is having uh, different uh, regulations so uh, for a, a provider to to be in more than one uh, country is uh, is a uh, so some more collabor- collaboration needs to be done uh, there and if you look at uh, asia um, cherry uh, singapore is uh, doing a great uh, job uh, being uh, uh, in the forefront and the flag holder for uh, asia uh, to have uh, a uh, harmonized and i know uh, japan is uh, looking very much uh, to to uh, singapore and and of course uh, hong kong has always had a good link uh, to singapore so uh, with with the hope of singapore uh, leading on uh, with the yeah uh, the good structure uh, infrastructure and the uh, compliance and compliance uh, is good fit forward yes and uh, on that note if we were to bring ourselves back to the main topic uh, I just wanted to ask everyone if what sorts of opportunities have emerged as a result of covid if you have noticed any or perhaps um how remote working had impacted the way new fintech products are designed the necessity is uh, to to adopt digital just because uh, there is no physical interaction or exchange uh, uh so the acceleration that we have seen has been uh, very phenomenal and uh, in history we've uh, seen these uh, micro <laughs> nudges that have happened along the way for example in india a few years ago the demonetization triggered uh, suddenly a lot of currency notes uh, evaporated from circulation and uh, people had no choice but to adopt digital to continue to uh, create uh, day to day transactions covid has uh, pretty much done that at a global scale where mm. uh, uh, where physical interactions have suddenly evaporated you have no choice but to adopt digital and, and we've seen such acceleration of digital adoption as we've never seen in, in the past a uh, lot of innovations will actually come out of uh, this as uh, people uh, settle the long term uh, uh, things and i'll uh, again uh, come back to what susan was start, starting to say on the governance side uh, and i'll keep harping on my point that uh, that uh, data and trust is the new gold of uh, the future and uh, most companies today are grappling on how to uh, govern data which is very hard to do china is taking a particular philosophy for governing india we are beginning to see is uh, taking a hard stance on that as well uh, it really depends on how global uh, we consider data and trust to be a currency versus how local you uh, believe that uh, needs and that will determine how uh, fintech overall evolves over the next uh, in, in the post covid era I mean, at a philosophical level that is how i would say the battle of governance is going to determine uh, uh the the future of tomorrow 
for it. I think some of the use cases when, um, you know, I think of, you know, my company that was built on a modern tech platform with clean data. We've invested a lot in data governance and data lineage and data mapping and, and building out the infrastructure. And I think the real innovation will come through the use cases. So, so how are we thinking about using that data to drive much more advanced personalization for our customers and recognition of the relationship and understanding how to communicate with customers much more impactfully. Uh, but I also think there's a number of use cases around uh, fraud detection, you know, BSA, AML, um, driving greater operational efficiency. And so I think there's a number of ways that you're going to see innovation coming as, as more customers are coming onto these platforms. I mean, for us, just in the last year, we've seen a thousand percent growth in deposits coming on. Um, you know, 300% growth in just spending um, that's happening on our platform. And, it, you know, again, COVID was a real inflection point, but that gives us access to just tons of information that we can use to start to evolve these use cases around our customers' experience, but also around how to uh, focus on safety and soundness as well. Mm. Um, cost, uh, also the market is uh, acutely uh, cost sensitive, and if it, in particular, if you're talking about uh, uh, financial inclusion in the in the emerging market, uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, and uh, Latin America, and then uh, customization of uh, the market are different. Uh, even though uh, we wanted to be as harmonized as possible, so we need to align the solution to cultural expectations uh, and uh, and the preferences. So I think that's uh, why to get into it, and then uh, you you always have the the big uh, big tech, uh, tech companies coming in. Uh, but I think uh, the balance between the, the local um, fintech companies versus uh, the big uh, tech companies that balance uh, we will have more uh, more uh, battles around that uh, throughout uh, the world. I think. Nice. Um, well, so Suzanne, maybe you could add a little bit on how scaling fintech would be very different across countries, perhaps um, as a result of, of um, COVID or not, even cross borders growth. If, if I'm starting with the uh, with the Nordic, um, where. Uh, it's uh, digital, every, almost everything, a cashless society. So, so all the infrastructure is is uh, there. So it's it's uh, it's a matter of uh, taking the leap uh, once you have succeeded in uh, one uh, country uh, to go uh, further to to the next. Uh, uh, so starting in in one country in in, uh, in the Nordics, take Nordics, and then uh, Europe seems to be a, a trend that is uh, going forward. That have funding or at least. Uh, some income to, to build up. And then you need talent. Talent is uh, scarce. Uh, to get good tech people, good uh, salespeople, marketing, and, and uh, so forth, that is. And I think, of course, there has been some bankruptcy, some that have closed uh, down their business. Uh, and in particular, if you are in more uh, sensitive uh, segments like uh, tourism and uh, and uh, yeah, traveling and, and so forth, that has been uh, challenging. It's far more on the on the merchant uh, side that are selling goods, uh, and then it's just a matter of the logistic uh, to it. But it, it's it's a mindset, and then getting the, the talent is, is of course a critical thing, and make sure that you have the good people on the board and good people in the executive committee, and uh, and then going forward because eventually you become a very big company, and then you have to. Follow those uh, uh, rules uh, that is uh, different compared to being a, a small uh, startup. Yeah, um, and I guess uh, where we are, where I'm from, um, what we're seeing is remote working. That's more uh, more of a permanent thing now. Uh, companies in Singapore are even looking at hiring people outside of Singapore mm. that they would have otherwise relocated um, mm. in the past. Uh, we get our tech talent mostly from India, Vietnam, uh, because of the education system in Singapore that did not prioritize that in the 20 years back. Um, so uh, we, we see companies uh, considering these movements now. Um, also to add on on the scaling portion, I, I just thought about something, how scaling in the Nordics and Europe would be easier than where uh, things are in Southeast Asia. Where Singapore is predominantly in English, uh, but a Chinese 
a heavily Chinese populated country. While if you move to Malaysia further up and then to Indonesia, cultures actually differ very largely that we can't apply the same data sets and inference in these three countries alone. So that, that becomes a problem when we scale. Hmm. And, I, and I think the scaling challenge, I mean, it does vary quite a bit based on the market, you know, your, or at least your origin market. I mean, but prior to starting Varo, I ran the uh, European consumer business uh, across, you know, in really all markets in Europe. And so, so we had different challenges in different markets because there's localization challenges. But if you start in a market like India or China or Brazil or the US, you have a massive market. And, and it really becomes about how do you get mainstream adoption and move beyond early adopters into mainstream adopters and becoming a real credible alternative. And I think the path for all successful companies has really been around defining that core product value for customers and and find and being able to be really clear in why somebody should switch and and what is the value that they derive by switching to your product uh, and, and, and also in a way that they want to tell other people um, and creating those network effects where you can actually get people talking about your product and and um, having them uh, spreading the word on your behalf I think is really important and you've seen examples of this now occurring um, all across the world but certainly when you start in a big market you've got a lot more runway than when you start in a smaller market and then you really do have to start to tackle some of these issues of going mm. international earlier and, and dealing with some of the localization challenges. The scaling in India market is a pretty unique beast uh, where uh, the majority of the population is still not non-digital uh, and uh, getting them onto being the first time digital adopters is really the big uh, challenge where uh, just access to uh, large portions of the population is very hard to come by. And uh, I've been fortunate to advise a few companies that were playing in that uh, segment of how do you uh, take uh, somebody in a remote uh, village who's uh, never been exposed to anything digital to get them to understand a concept of what a deposit account really is. And uh, the challenges of administrating it in a in a area where there is no telecommunications infrastructure whatsoever, mm. and uh, uh, there is only one merchant store in the uh, in a collection of set of uh, where everybody comes to buy their essential supplies, whatever be the supply, it doesn't matter. And uh, uh, and at that level, how do you get people to understand that? Uh, the rupee note is no longer important for you. It will all be in some obscure digital <laughs> wallet of some kind. Uh, it's a very interesting challenge. In fact, uh, the mainstream regulators have had a challenge uh, converting people to so the banks and uh, even the rural banks that uh, have large footprints have challenged uh, of adopting and, and, and converting these set of uh, users uh, and leave alone the cost economics of doing it profitably. Mm. Uh, that's another. Uh, yeah. The good <laughs> news with problem. India, though, is even if you had 15% early adopters, you're still bigger than most countries in the world. <laughs> uh, Which is true. Million people. Yeah. But remember, India is a collection of multiple sub countries right. with right. so many subcultures. <laughs> each behaving very differently than the other. It's almost like uh, European Union is not a country. <laughs> India is somewhat like that. It's a collection of uh, different mm. cultures. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I mean, uh, the two parts of scaling that is important is how do you make money in the puzzle? And the only way we've seen uh, companies have a shot of making money and doing it profitably is when you go with a bouquet of uh, offerings and not limit yourself either to a digital wallet or a payment or uh, you have to look at it from a lending, you have to look at it from a, uh, insurance, you have to look at it from many perspectives and you will make uh, some money in some slice in some segments and not in all, but it's really the collection that you have a chance of becoming uh, profitable as a, as a unit. The standalone plays, and this is something Colin, you had mentioned, uh, uh, earlier as a post-COVID, uh, 
it's really about unifying a lot of services together is yeah. really what uh, the trend you're beginning to see. But that's the reality of uh, getting into Southeast Asia market uh, uh, to understand. We are uh, helping a lot of companies through uh, Amazon, PayPal, Adopt. And, and the experience is very similar. I mean, you go and talk to somebody and they say, but I, can I also do this and that and that? And we are cycling that back to the companies and they're beginning to think about uh, introducing new and more holistic coverage to what is needed. Well, and w you know, when we started Borrow, it w we very much uh, had the intent of building that primary banking relationship for exactly what you're talking about. Because is that you get the, the trusted, you know, core banking relationship, and then you can introduce other products because, and, and in a very natural way, because you you understand the customer, you understand the pain points that they're solving for, versus when you just sort of have a collection of products, and you almost have to reacquire a customer every time because you know you're not necessarily meeting all the needs of a single customer. And I think focusing on that kind of trusted relationship, whether it's a small business or a, a larger business or a consumer, I think that's to me the, the the banking strategy that has been most successful and has the greatest chance of, of becoming sustainable and, and, and profitable. Yeah, and, and that's uh, been the, the asset for the banks that they have the, the trust uh, and uh, they have a good uh, large uh, customer base. Uh, and the challenge for the banks uh, traditionally is that they, they haven't been the, uh, too uh, agile in their way and not utilizing uh, the newest technology because they're sitting on the legacy system that uh, it's going to cost them a fortune just to throw it out. So yeah. the combination or the collaboration, uh, I think, between the fintechs and the banks is, is uh, the thing going forward or, or is for the, the new, the new uh, uh, innovation. Uh, and we see a lot of examples of this in, in the northern uh, Europe that uh, they can, ha can benefit uh, uh, tremendously because each side is sitting on uh, uh, different uh, assets. But in the combination, it, it's a very powerful thing. It seems, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time yet. Um, shall we close this off with uh, a point from each of you? I can go first, and I'll come back to my favorite topic, that uh, <laughs> data is the new gold of uh, tomorrow, and companies that understand data and trust well at the heart of it will become the Federal Reserve's equivalent of tomorrow. And I'm uh, repeating, uh, collaboration is the new innovation. Uh, you come farther uh, if you collaborate uh, rather than uh, running it by yourself. And I guess I'll end on that. I think fintech represents an enormous opportunity to bring greater financial inclusion and financial opportunity to millions of people across the world by focusing on using technology to provide better services, more affordable services. And I think COVID is definitely accelerating those trends. And uh, I'm excited about what, what the future holds. Nice. Um, and I would add, I think um, I agree with Colin a lot. Um, I think where fintech should go is to prioritize the client, the customer's needs first, uh, using tech as an enabler to provide a good service uh, versus getting the financial institutions just uh, ditching out products that would benefit them more than anyone else uh, without much consideration of the consumer at all. Yeah. Um, yes, I think this has been really nice speaking with everyone. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have time for um, a question, but can you guys see the questions at all? Yeah, I see. That. So there was one question around what leadership culture are you seeing in the fintech industry? And I think, I mean, I think it varies. I mean, there's a little bit of venture funded culture that is sort of grow at all costs and figure out how to make money down the road. I don't know that I subscribe to that. Um, I mean, for me, it's about uh, a culture of customer focus. And as you were saying, Sherry, like, like really being very determined around how we can um, better solve problems for customers using technology um, and more innovative solutions, but also with a foundation of a stable business model. Those are the things that, that, that when I think about leaders and, and who I want to bring in. Um, you know, I, it's very much been around that customer obsession, but also the, the understanding how to, how to build a sustainable business. 
Yeah, there is one uh, question here about uh, leadership uh, culture in the in the uh, fintech uh, uh, industry. I don't think it's in a special uh, leadership culture for the fintech industry. It, it's all about uh, having a, a good team and then the, uh, be uh, of course uh, being uh, global in their thinking and then have a sustainable uh, system and seamless uh, technology and then of course uh, be very very close uh, to your customers. Nice. I think that's all the time we have. Um, thank you, everyone. Shall we take a group selfie and see how this works? Yep. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. Oh, okay. Hold on. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. Hope that worked. All right. Thank you. Thank right. you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. It's been a pleasure. All right. Bye bye. Thank it's you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.